Hello everybody, welcome to this week's edition of The Verdict when we focus entirely on the Kipco's Guineas Festival. Three days of some fantastic action, run on contrasting ground there and that has to be factored into all calculations. Started the meeting on decent ground uh, on the Friday with a bit of a tailwind. It was very bad on Saturday after a lot of rain. It became heavy and then it was soft and tacky on Sunday. We're going to start on the Friday though and uh, there were some nice performances on the day. We'll have a look at uh, Muta Sabek and Hurricane Lane from the day. Muta Sabek's time, pretty good really, just 1.28 outside standard, telling us that uh, the ground was definitely good, maybe just a little bit better than good. Hurricane Lane's time quite slow, but that was a function of the run of the race. And we'll get to him in a moment. But let's start with Muta Sabek, who was very impressive in winning the 150 contest. He went off second favourite behind the returning Native Trail, who was 8 to 11 and well backed. Mutasabek was 4 to 1. It was 5's light infantry, a big drifter, check and challenge 11's, and 22 to 1 Imperial fighter. Uh, I've picked this out because this is a typical rolly mile performance from Mutasabek. Making the running at this track is generally a massive advantage, particularly with a tailwind, and there was a minor tailwind behind them on this occasion. And he's a fast horse, and he's able to dominate this contest from the front. Jim Crowley gets something of an easy lead out in front, and he is never troubled thereafter to land this bet 365 mile in really good style. His finishing speed percentage tells us he didn't go that quick out in front, 106.09. Last three furlongs, therefore, 6% quicker than the earlier part of the race. Native trail, getting a trail in behind, Look at that high knee action that he's got. And he runs perfectly well, I think, in defeat. But Muta Sabek got an easy out in front on his own. And then he was able to sprint through the sixth and seventh furlong. And that was what was impressive about this performance. His sixth furlong, he went 11.10. And then the seventh furlong, the penultimate, was the big one, where he put his rivals to the sword with a 10.96 one of the only horses over the three days to dip under 11 seconds for a furlong. Nothing was going to do it on the Saturday and Sunday when the ground was much worse than that than they encountered on the Friday. Here he is, sprinting now. Native Trail, he picks up pretty well according to the course track sectionals too, and he was only 0.3 of a second slower than the winner through the final three furlongs. So those that felt Native Trail was disappointing, I don't think he necessarily was. He flashed plenty of speed through the final three furlongs. It was just that Muta Sabek got a solo. He got an easy lead out there, and it's very hard to peg horses back when they're able to save energy and then sprint from the front. You've got to go very, very fast if you're going to run a horse like him down when you've given him the advantage of an easy lead. This track really suits his style, Muta Sabek. Four of his six wins have come here at the Roly Mile. He likes bowling along, preferably with a small field as well. He's a fast horse, he's a talented horse, but he's much, much better when he gets his own way. Charlie Hill said after the race that possibly the Lockinge would be where he'll go next, and that will be a much deeper race than this, a much tougher ask you'd have thought for the Lockinge in about a fortnight's time. But it's worth rolling the dice and taking him to Newbury, and if he does get a solo, he'll be quite hard to peg back. What about Native Trail? Well, he's run really well for me. In defeat. I'm certainly not giving up on him at all. I think he'll come back a much better horse. He'll strip fitter for this outing and there'll be more to come from him somewhere in the season. This might just have been Muta Sabek's day, but on the day he was very good indeed. And those two furlongs that he fired, 11.1 and 10.96, they were very impressive for this horse. He's talented, but he just doesn't want to be in the heat of a battle for too long. And if he's allowed to roll like he did on Friday afternoon, and he's a pretty hard horse to peg back. Well done to Charlie Hills and Jim Crowley. Let's have a look now at the Jockey Club Stakes, Group 2, over a mile and a half. West Wind Blows is quite a short favourite here, even money. Hurricane Lane, uh, 2 to 1, very well back just before the off, in from uh, 5 to 2. Global Storm, 9 to 2. And Outbox and Julie, my crown, big prices, the two outsiders, and they didn't uh, really figure. For it was Hurricane Lane who bounced back to form here, beating West Wind Blows and Global Storm. Stall two beats four, beats five. Let's see how he achieved this victory. And the first thing to do is put this race into context for Hurricane Lane. He was coming here on the back of a woeful effort in the John Porter at Newbury. Finished last, he didn't really handle the very heavy ground that day. 
and he looked like his light had gone out really uh, here they fitted him with cheek pieces and the old hurricane lane dropped in grade a little bit into a group two is back he proved that he's back and he's got the engine intact and there could be more to come from him uh, this season he um he traveled it in third most of the race they didn't go a very strong gallop early on uh, and i thought this might just there he is just in there might mitigate against him a little bit but the turn of foot that he showed really tells me that he really is intact and ready to go again and perhaps win another group one somewhere down the line the finishing speed percentage uh, it's 104.52, so again they've gone quite steady like the Muta Sabek race and it's turned into a little bit of a sprint. He's come home 4.5% quicker in the final three furlongs than he ran uh, the rest of the race. And if you, you sort of boil his figures down, he's quite impressive in the final half mile. For throughout that half mile, he is quicker than all of his rivals. And that tells me that he's been completely dominant in this race. He has dominated lessers and has done so in very good style. West Wind Blow second, Global Storm third. Uh, they had a good uh, tussle and um, they got pretty close in the closing stages. The stewards had a look and they reversed the placings um, because there was a little bit of argy-bargy in the closing stages. But they were nowhere near the winner. And let's just boil these figures down. His final three furlongs, 36.65. Now that doesn't mean a lot unless you compare it to the runner-up. The runner-up was 37.61, fully a second plus slower than Hurricane Lane. That's how dominant he was. And why was he that good? Well, look at him here. Look at the way he moves into the race and then quickens, firing those quick furlongs. 11.97 for the 11th furlong. And that has completely destroyed his field. None of them can live with that turn of pace. And he's won quite cosily. William Buick's not too harsh on him in the closing stages. He's handled the undulations and the dip, no problem at all. And the cheek pieces have perhaps helped him concentrate a little bit more. And we all probably wrote him off too soon after his very poor Newbury effort, but maybe the ground was just too heavy there. He's a big horse as well, big heavy topped horse. He might just have needed the run very badly too, but he's certainly back now. Look at the second and third, they're in a good tussle. West Wind Blows and a Global Storm, and they came quite close in the closing stages. And the, the, uh, Placings were revised, Global Storm getting second place ahead of West Wind Blows in the stewards room. But here he is in isolation, look at him change legs there as he went down into the dip. And he picks up uh, very well. The Hardwick and the Coronation are possibilities for him. He's entered in, in both of them. We know from his derby exploits that he handles Epsom. So it's possible that they might go there to um, Epsom on the Coronation Day. And uh, he'll be a horse to, to beat there because I think he's definitely back, not maybe quite at his best, but he didn't get a strongly run race here. If he got a better run race, we might see an even better Hurricane Lane. Charlie Appleby has got this horse back. So from Friday, let's turn our attentions to 2000 Guineas Day on the Saturday. In contrasting conditions on the Roly Mile, uh, there was an awful lot of rain and we ended up with the heavy ground, certainly by the end of the day and probably for the Guineas as well, which has run at 4.40. It certainly got worse as the day went on, as those times tell you. They're all uh, pretty slow. Look at uh, Timusius Fox, who was impressive in the opener. 7.66 slower than standard. King of Conquest for Godolphin, 5.88 slower. And uh, even uh, Caldine in the Guineas, 5.74 outside standard. You rarely see that in the Colts or the Phillies classic. But he was a good enough winner. Let's have a look and see what price he was. He was hammered in the market just before the off. Fives into seven to two. August Rodin was the favourite at 13 to eight. Things didn't go right. Then we had Caldine and Little Big Bear. It was a five to one shot. Things didn't go right for him either. Noble style tens, Royal Scotsman 11s and 14s and bigger. The rest on paper, it looked like a very deep race. And to a degree though, it was about handling conditions out there because, wow, it was testing. Caldine, the winner, he came out of stall number three. The second horse was from four. It's High Royal at a big price for Kevin Ryan and O'Sheen Murphy. Royal Scotsman jumped out of stall number 11 and Galleron from eight finished in fourth spot. I don't think there was any track bias at play at all, even though the first and second came from the far side. They all raced up the middle of the track. The early trouble, the early problems with this side of the track. You've got Little Big Bear, Royal Scotsman too keen, 
out in front and August Rodin with the white stripe on his face. And I think little Big Bear gets struck into and that hampers August Rodin, uh, the favourite. It's getting messy in there. Look at Royal Scotsman pulling really hard and more of Royal Scotsman a little bit later on. But it was all a bit messy this side of the track. I don't quite know why August Rodin ran poorly. It's just there, look, something's happened. Wayne Lorden's taken a pull out of Little Big Bear. August Rodin not really travelling in behind. Meanwhile, far side, always prominent. Roly Miles style, generally need to be prominent are the first two home. Royal Scotsman, look at his head there. He's still reefing and pulling. Look at his head to one side there. He's a remarkable effort for him to finish third, given all the energy that he used up in the early part of the race. So what sort of a race did we have? Well, we had a messy one for those horses stand side, pretty clean for those far side, and an evenly run one as well. They didn't hang about here at all. Finishing speed percentage was 99.15, and the winner, quickening up, quite well in the closing stages. He went through the final three furlongs in 38.44. You'd expect quicker than that, but you've got to factor in the ground. And the next best, 38.53. And the next best in the race was Royal Scotsman, not High Royal. So Royal Scotsman finished off the race quicker than everything else bar Caldine. Royal Scotsman here, running on strongly despite having pulled hard. He's definitely an eye catcher out of this race. I'm sure he doesn't want to go up in trip, down in trip if anything, because he's speedy and he needs a bit of cover and then utilize that speed. Maybe St. James's Palace stakes for him. And that's where they're probably going to go with Caldine. High Royal running around a bit under O'Sheen Murphy, but then straightened out with a whip in his left hand and he rallies quite well thereafter. And he finds a bit more when Royal Scotsman gets to him. But Caldine straight forward for Dettori far side, just about make all this horse head bowed in honesty, going all the way to the line, handling conditions very well, seeing off the big priced High Royal, Royal Scotsman, and Galeron's run very well in fourth place. Royal Scotsman was too keen, but I'm gonna highlight his individual seventh furlong, 12.39. He was the fastest through the race in that penultimate furlong. And I can't praise Royal Scotsman enough for this effort, and this ground, he probably wants better ground, and he just wants to settle a little bit better. What of the winner? Well, he may clash with Royal Scotsman for the St. James's Palace Stakes is the possible a route they're going to take with uh, Caldine. He's clearly uh, very useful. It was Dewhurst form to the fore here uh, with Caldine and uh, Royal Scotsman. Um, De Tory, we've got to mention him, haven't we? Could be his final 2,000 guineas. And he ended on a, a winning note. He didn't know, unusually for him, didn't know what to say afterwards. I think he was a bit overcome with, with emotion. Um, but. It was a straightforward one for him, really. He didn't have to do anything fancy out there. The race fell apart a little bit with the O'Brien duo not really giving their running. There'll be other days for them. I think Little Big Bear might be a, a Commonwealth Cup horse going forward. They might well go back to sprinting uh, with him. But a, a superb result for the, the Andrew Balding team, uh, for Judmont, and of course, Frankie de Tour. Uh, from heavy ground on the Saturday in the 2,000 guineas, we go to 1,000 guineas day on Sunday, where conditions dried out a little bit, but it was a bit tacky uh, out there nonetheless, as you might expect, after all the heavy rain that had fallen. It does drain well at Newmarket, it's uh, chalk-based, so it does drain pretty well. Uh, so the times were better than those that we saw on the Saturday, sort of good to soft times, uh, really. And furlong per furlong is a, a very good effort from Morge and Via Sistina, uh, Adiar as well, and not too bad from the running line. We will get to Morge. Uh, and on one of the, the best performances of the weekend by a mile. But we'll go to Running Lion, uh, first of all, who won the uh, mile and a quarter pretty poly listed race. And um, Queen of Ferries went off in number four, Running Lion 100 to 30. Trust the stars the same. Floating Spirit 15 to two and same for Sumo Sam. Twelves and bigger the rest. Running Lion then, visually very impressive. Let's have a look and see what was achieved out there on the track by her. Um, she previously won at Kempton coming uh, into this. Uh, she's trained by John uh, Thady Gosden, and I think she is a filly of rare potential. I think she's very much going places. I'll just pick her out over on the far side here, uh, just getting a little bit of cover in the early part of the race. And that was sensible, really, because this was strongly run. There was no hanging about here. This wasn't a Hurricane Lane style race. It wasn't a Mutasabek style race. 
it was a strongly run race. Look at these fractions early on. The second furlong, it went under 12, 11.81. The eighth furlong, 11.86 after that. They were not messing about in the early part of this race. And in the conditions, this was about who could sustain their speed longest. And quite a few of these wilted in the closing stages. The running line didn't. She was able to maintain an even tempo all the way to the line and was most impressive. And I think she's just about the most impressive winner of the meeting. It wasn't the best performance on the clock. That's still to come. But this was very good from her. And I think she might be even better on better ground. She's by Roaring Lion out of a Dan Silly Man. While she handled conditions here, I think she might be even better when she encounters good or even uh, faster ground. Uh, she's got cover here. She's cantering all over them at this point, And she's about to come home evenly. And I'll cite you the sectionals that she achieved. Furlong 7, 12.35. Furlong 8, 12.52. Furlong 9, 12.27. Sustaining her speed through those three furlongs. There's the ninth furlong of 12.27. Nothing could, other, other, no other horse in the race could do anything like that. They couldn't sustain the speed off what was a strong gallop, but she could. She just kept rolling. Now she hasn't quickened up wildly out there. The ground's not letting her, but she's keeping going when others can't. Look how strung out they are. She just keeps on churning out even fractions. And that marks her out as being a very good horse. I think she's potentially top class. You can keep churning out 12 second furlongs on decent ground when you go 10 or 12 furlongs. You're top class. And I think she could do that on decent ground. Where next? That's the big question. And I think the Gosdens will have to have a think about the Oaks. It's surely something that they're going to, to mull over. The Pre de Diane is a possibility as well over 10 furlongs. And 10 might suit her a little bit better. Certainly on pedigree, that might be the way to go. For Roaring Lion, remember him in the derby? Well, he didn't really stay. And this filly's mare is by Dan Silly. That suggests decent ground might be required to, for her to give up her best. And maybe a mile, a mile and a quarter is what she wants for. Remember, the Gosdens thought about the Guineas, but they decided to come for this pretty Polly instead. So decisions to be made about her future, but they're nice decisions to make because wherever she goes, she is going to be very competitive. I have no doubt against her own sex now. In a Group 1 contest, she would be more than competitive. I'll put my neck on the line and say that she will win a Group 1 in Europe this season. Don't know where, as of yet. Don't know what the Gosdens want to do with her. But look at her attitude, tremendous attitude. A Group 1 winner in waiting. Jockey Oshi Murphy was very impressed with her afterwards. Visually, she looked good. And more importantly, the clock told us. She was very good out there on the Roly Mile. Okay, let's go to the best time performance of the weekend by some way. It was the Kipco 1000 Guineas, 3.40 on Sunday afternoon. Tahira, the 6-4 to four favourite to meditate, 5-1 to one from 7s. Late money for that. Dream of Love for Charlie Appleby, 17-2. to two. Remarque, 17-2. to two. Morge was 9-1 to one from 10s, and it was 11s and bigger. The rest of it included the Nell Gwynn winner, Mama's Girl. But it was Morge who caused a bit of an upset. She jumped out of stall number seven. The second horse was Tahira, came from 15, long way apart, weren't they? Matilda Picot, what a big run from her. She's just in here in, in seven. And uh, Carnarvon, back in fourth place, staying on very strongly. Keep an eye on Carnarvon, staying on strongly in the closing stages, coming home quite well, according to the uh, course track sectionals. This was honestly run, truly run, perhaps a bit too quick. And the finishing speed percentage was 97.84 and what it produced was the best time performance of the season by some way. It was a very good effort from Morge and Tahira and they pulled clear of the rest and had a, a real set two in the final two furlongs and Tahira, well she looked all over the winner as she cruised up to Morge but Morge just kept finding more perhaps the benefit of a couple of runs at Maidan this season uh, saw her just having the fitness edge, maybe. And she's certainly a good filly, and she's uh, very tough indeed. When she'd won at Maidan, uh, her last start, she'd beaten Ferry Cross uh, comprehensively, and Ferry Cross ran very well to be placed in the, in the Nell Gwynn. So I guess the form was there uh, for everybody uh, to note. Now let's just talk about track position, because Morge was more forwardly placed than Tahira. Tahira's in here. 
and here's here's Morge out in front. So it was just a bit, perhaps a bit too far back for Tahira. Had to do a bit of running to get to Morge and then got engaged in a duel thereafter and might just have been a little bit too far back. Tahira did finish the race stronger than Morge. Final three furlongs, 37.34, 0.19 faster than Morge. You'd ask yourself then, well, why didn't why didn't Tahira beat Morge then if she was faster in the final three furlongs? Because she fired those three furlongs from further back. She had to make up ground on Morge, who was tiring. Look at that, 97.84%. She's slowing down. They're getting tired in front, but they're pulling well clear of Matilda Picotte in third. Carnarvon far side running on nicely for fourth place, and Morge just clinging on. She's an exceeding excel filly, and... Um, she might be better on faster ground. She certainly looked better on faster ground at uh, Maidan, and that, that might suit her a little bit better. But look at this head on now, and see what you think. They come pretty close together, don't they? And Morge, to my eye, definitely takes Tahira across the track a little bit. Here they are, just about to engage in battle up front. So I think the stewards formally had a look, look at this. I think they, they would have looked at it, obviously. Um, to here at this stage going very well. There's Morge edging right. There was no contact, but she definitely took her across the track a little bit, and she was off a off a straight line for a while. Now they're straight and true, both of them, at this particular point. Morge just wanting to edge edge to her right again. She's just going that way a little bit, isn't she? Throughout that final furlong and a half. But, uh, stewards felt that was perfect, perfectly okay. I think that's probably the right decision. Um, I think that they should perhaps formally have announced an inquiry and let everyone know that they were, gonna, they were looking at it. But I don't think, I don't think it, it stopped Tahira from uh, winning the race. And I think she rightly uh, kept it. Um, and she's very good. This time was, this time was really good. It's a, it was a high triple digit speed figure that she achieved. It was a strongly run race. It wasn't falsely run at all. Uh, and Tahira likewise, she performed very well on the clock. She's the only filly that went under uh, 12 seconds in the sixth furlong of the race. That's when she was making up her ground. Nothing else could go under 12 seconds through that furlong. So she's shaped incredibly well in second place, but perhaps just had a little bit to do. She was a few lengths back from Morge, and they do take some pegging back here on the Roly Mile. We've seen that so far in the verdict uh, with uh, Muta Sabek. Uh, once you get out in front, they're quite hard to, to pick up. And Tahira got there, but she had nothing left for the fight in the final 100 yards. All in all, though, I think it's a very good race, that. It's going to work out particularly well. Tahira will definitely stay further, uh, and perhaps the Oaks is where they'll, they'll go with her. I think she's got plenty of stamina on the damn side of the pedigree, and it, it could be that classic for her next. Morge probably will always be best at around a mile. So finally, we're going to look at one of the two races that was transferred from the abandoned uh, Sandown meeting. It's the Bet365 Gordon Richards Stakes Group 3 over a mile and a quarter. Adial was back. He was the odds-on favourite. And Mark was second in at 9-4. to four. Migration 8-1. to one, And it's 11 Highland Avenue. Regal Reality, the outsider. 22-1. to one, A big drifter in the market. And Charlie Appleby does it again. Saw him get Hurricane Lane back. And now he's got Adial back as well. He really is a world-class trainer. And this is a good advertisement for what he can do. Highland Avenue uh, was third from store three. Regal Reality managed to, to finish fourth. So here we go, mile and a quarter of the trip here. Um, and this was a pretty strongly run race, actually. There was no uh, messing about here. That suits Adiar because he stays further than uh, 10 furlongs. We know that he stays a mile and a half. Um, and he'll surely be back to that trip uh, next time up. But they went, they went quite hard early on. Um, first furlong was quite steady. But then Highland Avenue uh, took up the mantle and got on with it out in front. The third furlong, 11.97. The fourth was exactly the same uh, as well. So carving out fractions under 12 seconds over a mile and a quarter means they were, they were not hanging about at all. And Adiar, as you might expect, was just relentless through this race and really quite impressive as well. Uh, to your eye, he looked very good. And the clock says he was pretty good as well and, and tuned up for this. His eighth furlong of 12.1 uh, and his ninth furlong of 12.23 uh, uh, show just how relentless he was through the final three furlongs. He just kept rolling. He kept on galloping out there. There's no sign of him blowing up or getting tired. And he was strong all the way through the line. He only had a couple of runs, didn't he, in, in 2022. 
but now back with this confidence booster if you believe in that sort of thing um, in a group two bit of a dropping grade for him uh, he'll be straight into group one company after this and that's in the shadwell colors he's going pretty well at this stage but it's, it's adyar who's got uh, well he's going to pounce first really and he sprints home through those final uh, three furlongs he's only had 11 runs in his career today and a five-year-old with just 11 runs behind him so charlie apple we still got plenty to work on and i think the real adyar has stood up here and won very nicely the coronation could be next you'd have thought it's possibly where they'll they'll go with him this is him firing those two furlongs i referred to the eighth at 12.1 and 12.23 uh, for the ninth yes he got tired in the final furlong according to the course track sectionals but uh, that happens just about every single racehorse is always slowing down through the final furlong not getting quicker and it's just hands and heels stuff uh, from uh, william buick in the closing stages i was very impressed with that there was no hiding place out there courtesy of highland avenue and uh, adiar didn't shy away from the challenge now it won't be the strongest group two you'll ever see this um, but he was able to do what charlie appleby wanted him to do which was just prove his well-being and not have a hard race because you don't want to go to a group one next and bounce out of this particular effort and william Buick wasn't hard on him and the cut in the ground as you can see there they're getting into it a bit that helped him a little bit before he hits the ground quite hard he does handle decent ground uh, but a little bit of cut doesn't harm him whatsoever look at the others all well beaten off and mark running on to get past highland avenue who tired after setting those stern early fractions regal reality an absolute mile back um, running on to grab third spot uh, taking performance and uh, very much an advertisement for uh, charlie appleby's uh, skills i think the thoroughbred rankings have him as the the best trainer in the world at the moment and i think they're probably right because he's got tremendous record in north america he's got a fantastic record when he sends horses to australia and uh, here at the roly mile he's, he's very good as well he's a leading trainer in terms of strike rate at the roly mile and it's uh, proved just why over the last uh, few days there with plenty of winners including uh, this fella who's back look out for him in a group one next over a mile and a half i think the coronation would be ideal for him and it's not improbable that he'll, he'll bump into hurricane lane or let them take each other on at some point so very good meeting then for charlie appleby and uh, william buick so that's it for this week's edition of the verdict i hope you enjoyed uh, looking back at those six races the best time performance let me remind you was morge but you've got to put tahira in there as well because she made uh, morge fight all the way to the line as they pulled a long way clear uh, of the third horse and indeed of the toiling others in that contest i thought that was a, a very good effort from her running line as well she is a filly to conjure with she's definitely a filly to take out of the verdict uh, this week a group one success awaits her you would have thought from the gosden yard so that's it uh, for this week i'll see you again next time around thanks for watching Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.